Hey guys, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we are live. Uh, welcome, welcome to the first stream, uh, first solo panel of this fun virtual experience. Uh, my name is Tim Harrison with HTC Fabrication. For those of you who aren't familiar on, uh, with our work, we are streaming live on uh, Facebook and Twitch currently. I uh, will be taking questions from Facebook and Twitch. Uh, just testing out this new platform, uh, and it's uh, apparently uh, streaming on Instagram as well, but the uh, everything is a little wonky, so I apologize if you're viewing us there. Hop on over to our Facebook page or Twitch, HDC Fabrication on both, and uh, you can check us out then. Um, first and foremost... Thank you guys for being here. Uh, I know this has been an interesting time for us all. Uh, thank you, Arta Wiggs, for putting together this fantastic virtual convention experience and uh, having us be a part of it. Uh, we've done, uh, it was great working with um, Papa Bear uh, and uh, Wolfgar and a handful of other people uh, with all this sort of stuff. But uh, let's get down to business. So welcome to Let's Muck It Up. Uh, this is an intro and kind of our thought process into uh, finishing and uh, aging and distressing techniques. Uh, we'll pretty much kind of go through my process when finishing uh, multiple kinds of base materials. We will talk about what you can do with uh, foam stuff. Uh, this Robin Armor, it's 100% foam. Uh, HD foam. Um, I'll talk about uh, how you can get kind of these realistic and dirty materials on that. Uh, we will talk about distressing 3D printed stuff. Um, every hard part and weapons on this Mandalorian is 100% 3D printed. I've got some of the stuff actually here with me to show examples of finished and unfinished stuff. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit into uh, resin and casting. Uh, trying to hit a lot of the base materials that uh, a lot of cosplayers and fabricators make. Uh, this is traditionally sculpted versus digitally sculpted and 3D printed um, and uh, sculpted out of monster clay and then uh, molded and cast from there. So we'll talk about that. We'll go a little bit into leather. Um, I know it's not, not as prevalent as a base material, but it, there's still uh, some cool things you can do to kind of get some nice age and hue and uh, synthetic abrasion and things like that on leathers um, that we'll kind of briefly talk on. And then also kind of like some kit bashing stuff, mixing some pre-made parts with uh, custom made parts, doing uh, actual real rusting techniques and things like that. Uh, and kind of combining all those things together, we'll talk about how uh, like I like to think about things, how I like to approach damage, how I like to approach dirts and colors and other things like that. Um, and if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, I'll be kind of taking questions as I kind of uh, get through each little section on my outline. And uh, let's get rolling. So aging and distression. Um, two of my favorite things uh, with prop and costume uh, fabrication and design are practical effects like electronics, smoke effects, animatronics, all that stuff, and uh, aging and distressing techniques. Uh, with, with the practical effects, I kind of like to think of it as it's, uh, it's a, a means to bring your prop to life. It takes a static object, it gives it motion, it um, gives it some breath, it gives it all sorts of fun physical and visible activity, be it, be it with simple lighting, smoke effects, light animatronics, anything with that. With uh, distressing, distressing and aging techniques, you take either that static prop or, or the combination of static and practical effect prop and uh, you give it history. You, it's, it's got a backstory now. It's been through uh, all sorts of things in order to give it this lived in world look that you're trying to represent and synthesize on this brand spanking new thing that you brought to life. Uh, it's, I think out of everything, it's one of my favorite things to do 
in this this whole world. Uh, but um, it's there's there's a lot a lot of cool things and a lot of subtle details that you can bring out with hue variations, texture details, uh, high gloss, low gloss, matte satin finishes, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, and uh, look forward to kind of sharing my uh, my mindset with you. Uh, so let's get rolling. I'm uh, juggling a few things here. So let's go into surface preparation first. Uh, with with no matter what you're kind of working with, uh, be it be it base foam or uh, 3D print or resin stuff. Um, before you put that. Uh, layer of paint down that initial base layer to kind of give you the medium to build your distressing and damage off of uh you need to get the prop to a point where it can properly uh display what all the like the story that you're going to give it um so let's start off with the foam work so as i mentioned before this guy is uh 100 foam uh, it's primarily 100% uh, HD, uh, excuse me, uh, HD foam from SKS Props. It's, uh, I believe, combination of 6, 4, and 2 millimeter, uh, or 6 and 2 and double stacked 2 to get the 4. Uh, I, don't, I don't actually know if the 4 millimeter was out at that moment, but I digress. So uh, one of the biggest things with foam being a flexible base surface is that you kind of need to compensate for that flexibility with your sealant and your paint you go on top of that and you kind of want to um, keep all of that rolling as you do it. Uh, one of the most popular uh, foam sealant techniques is using Plasti Dip. Uh, Plasti Dip is fantastic. Mod Podge is also good. Uh, Mod Podge is more rigid, but it's also a lot more readily available and also uh, a lot more available on the, for the budget builders and things like that. Uh, the, the biggest thing with Mod Podge is because it is more rigid, that it's more prone to cracking and uh, things like that. Um, also brush strokes, because uh, typically brush it on. Uh, Plasti Dip is nice because you can get it at most hardware stores unless you live in Chicago. <laughs> uh, but you can still go to the Burbs and get it here. It's a nice, flexible, durable, uh, rubberized spray sealant, and you can get some really cool finishes on it. What I prefer for most of my foam and flexible stuff is a product called uh, Creature Cast. Uh, Creature Cast is uh, originally a neoprene rubber developed for slush casting um, by a company uh, called Faust and Company. It's uh, they've got different different levels of rigidity. Uh, the one that works best for foam is their semi-rigid. And uh, what I really like about it is, uh, number one, the cost per volume is uh, much, much, much cheaper than uh, going the plastic dip route and things like that. Uh, if you have the setup for it, it works very well with HVL pre HVLP sprayers, excuse me, um, with paint booth uh, and things like that. The biggest thing is it's sandable. Uh, any little imperfections uh, that you get, even with overspray or drips or things like that, it's uh, being neoprene, uh, a harder neoprene, it's really easy to sand all that stuff off. If you want to do additional surface prep on top of that, you can also uh, sand things with that as well and go through um, a lot of the different sanding techniques to get some more finer finishes. Uh, you can also brush it on as well if you don't have access to the uh, that kind of spraying equipment. It's a very versatile material. Um, it's available to purchase in bulk, and um, it's uh, really really easy to work with. It's got a really quick dry time, which I like. Um, the quicker things set up, the quicker you can get on to the next step. Which, uh, especially if you're on the more productive uh, or, or business side of things, is time is very, very valuable commodity. Um, so with foams, uh, again, so typically you'll do all of your heat forming, all of your uh, 
uh, divots and distressing and damage marks. You can see a lot of the bullet holes and the cuts and gouges and things like that on here. Um, you want to make sure that you do all of that prior to the sealant stage. Uh, so with pretty much all of the damage that is on here, uh, I've used two bits on my Dremel rotary tool with a flex wand. Um, the biggest thing is that uh, I used a, a sanding drum and then the, uh, the pink uh, grinding and polishing bit. Uh, the sanding drum, if you manipulate it at different angles, it's really good for uh, creating those gash marks um, light scratches, heavy scratches, gaseous cuts, things like that. Uh, and you can also use the same thing depending upon how you manipulate it to get these big bullet holes. Pretty much what I'll do is I'll just kind of follow the rotation of the tool and let the tool guide me as um, it's hitting the surface. Uh, it's, it's a weird, weird thing to describe and something that you kind of learn with experience. Uh, I've, oddly enough, been using a, a rotary tool since about eighth grade, so I've got a lot of a lot of practice with with how they pull, um, how to how to utilize and work with their movement, um, and it's just something that kind of came easily to me. That uh, as I describe these techniques, I find out that they're a little harder to accomplish than that. So. Uh, it's just don't don't get frustrated. Just kind of continue practice. Get some scrap phones. Um, the flex wand on the Dremel is a very 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 valuable tool. Uh, in addition to that, that's uh, worth the thirty bucks if you've got a Dremel. Um, but you pretty much just manipulate the corner of the drum uh, and just work it in an, in a rotational fashion until you get the uh, get the damage and go from there. Um, but I'll also go into that uh, a little deeper when we talk about specific damages and, and things right now. I just want well, to kind of blow through uh, different surface preps and things like that. Any questions on uh, foam basic surface preparation before we move on? Boop, boo. I'm going to go. Uh, so let's talk about 3D printing. Um, 3D printing, especially in the last few years, has become pretty prevalent in the fabrication scene. Uh, it's great because there's a, there's a lot of a lot of different means to produce props with it. You can make your own files. You can source your own files. You can uh, do a lot of uh, multitasking with it, uh, and uh, one second. I'll. I, I see your question, Celeste. I'll. Uh, I'll get back to that um, after 3D printing stuff because that will apply to the foam and 3D printing if that's okay. Uh, the uh, the printers themselves have become very very affordable. Uh, be it on the hobby, hobby and professional side. And there's a lot of files out there. And even from, from the business perspective, you can outsource uh, file creation, be it to another member of your shop, to a different commissioner. Um, and then also multitask with uh, surface prep sanding and things like that. So when you surface prep 3D prints, uh, if the, the most common type of 3D printing tech right now is uh, um, the fused filament fabrication. Uh, this is a an FFF, um, FFF and FDM, if you guys see those with when it comes to 3D printing. Fused, uh, fused filament fabrication and uh, fused deposit model modeling. Um, they are the same exact thing. FDM got a copyright on it, so everybody else had to change it to FFF. Uh, so that's that's really the only difference. Uh, a lot of a lot of different printers. Really, really great for uh, 
large format printing. Uh, material is inexpensive. As soon as you get the uh, the machines themselves calibrated, they do a really, really clean job. Uh, this is version two of the Mandalorian helmet. Um, just to put these side by side with the, the finished. Um, so you can kind of see up close. Uh, it's got all those little, the little ribbing marks and that textural detail. Um, with this style of 3D printing, you're essentially looking at a tiny glue gun on a three-axis CNC setup that's just kind of rotating and oozing out goop until it layers upon itself to create the three-dimensional shape that you want to work with. Um, with that, it leaves all these little ribbed and textured surfaces. Uh, and the biggest thing, especially when you start working with surface preparation, especially high gloss surfaces, is you don't want those to be visible at all when you're printing with that stuff. So it's just really for 3D printing um, for this, it's a lot of sanding uh, for the most part. Uh, we've got a, uh, a Delta sander, a uh, little triangle head dude um, by uh, Proxen is the company. It's, I believe, uh, a German manufacturer. Uh, there's a distributor in Philadelphia, um, but they specialize in uh, precision sanding and uh, fabrication tools, a lot of really nice stuff. Uh, so something like that. There's, uh, I think, Black & Decker and like Ryobi and other things. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, they do, uh, they offer similar sanders. Uh, the Proxen's a, 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 a really, really beast. Um, it's just a, a little workhorse, so it's great for shop stuff. It does come with a price tag. They're about 150 bucks, uh, but it's something that you can run hard over and over again. Um, and I believe they've had a lifetime warranty as well. Uh, great tool. It's especially if you're used to 3D printing, um, all that hand sanding. Uh, it takes a lot of relief off of that. Uh, so if, if there's anything that you can do to kind of ease up and help with accelerating that finish and surface prep, it's 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 a really big deal. Um, you can oh you can you can totally sand it by hand. Uh, it's it just takes a lot of time, um, and uh, it also can be rough on your hands. Uh, pretty much like my process for let's say getting to this kind of finish is we'll take this base print this is printed in petg uh it's uh a more durable material than the common pla but um it also prints hotter uh but it's not as gummy when you sand it so it's uh, a lot lot easier to sand a lot easier to get to that that painting finish we will start with an 80 or 120 grit sandpaper be it on your mechanical device or by hand. Uh, and then we'll step up to 220 and then 320 or 340, depending upon the grit, and then 400, um, all by hand. Uh, hey, Mark, I know I'm actually streaming at three different surfaces right now, so it's good to, good to be running around playing with some new stuff. Um, and so we'll get to that 400 grit. Then we'll lay down a filler primer. What the filler primer does is it pretty much eas evens out the surface. If there is any deviation in those layer lines at all, it'll kind of fill those in. Uh, for those that are using rattle cans and uh, just access to hardware store, a Rust-Oleum filler primer, it's a really good product. It sprays really well. It's more of an enamel base, so it gums up a little more when you do that sanding, but it's fantastic. Um, uh, there's uh, a few other two-part like automotive high build filler primers that are really really great. Uh, U-Pull is one that we use. It's uh, it's a four to one ratio mixture to urethane base, uh, but you need to have a nice vent and HVLP gun set up to in order to spray it. But it's cool because number one, it's a urethane base, so it's a lot more durable. It's got a great adhesion. Uh, being a urethane base, you can pigment it with all the smooth, the smooth on pigments uh, used for their resins. Um, it can also be diluted to uh, not only work as a filler primer, but also your top layer sealant, depending upon what you're working on. So it's versatile. 
durable and also same as the creature cast it's uh, a lot better cost per volume which is really nice uh, if you have the tools to support it so lay down your filler primer sand it um, once you lay down the filler primer go back to the 320 grit sandpaper uh, make everything nice and pretty with that make a I mean, hop on the uh, the 400 grit that's all dry sanding now the fun part begins if you want to get like an achieve like a high gloss mirror finish um, <clears throat> there's a process called wet sanding you wet the sandpaper and then uh, move up incrementally uh, what we'll do is we'll start wet sanding after that filler primer and the dry sand to 400 uh, 400, 600, 800, 1,000, 12, 50, 5, 1,500, uh, sometimes 1,750 and 2,000. And uh, what that does is it gradually smooths down and polishes that filler primer coat, <clears throat> uh, removing all imperfections and like micro divots and things like that, uh, especially with, with high gloss finishes on, on rigid surfaces. That surface prep will really come into play. Um, because as soon as you lay down that initial gloss base, any minor imperfection will start to pop up and um, be super, super visible and detract from the overall finish that you're trying to achieve. Uh, so while it is very time consuming, uh, if that's the kind of finish that you're trying to achieve in the end product, it's worth your time to go and complete all those steps. Um, and honestly, once once you get past that kind of dry standing stage, the the wet standing stuff goes pretty quick, and it's uh, it's not as vigorous as the dry sanding, so it's a little easier to do. Uh, so that's basic surface prep with uh, 3D printing. Uh, any questions before I move on to Celeste's initial uh, initial question? I think there's a little bit of delay between the chats here, too. Uh, so, Celeste's question. Was... How do you avoid oversprays and drips? Uh, light coats. Uh, depending upon the... The... Uh, material that you're trying to spray, there's... A lot of uh, a lot of instruction on some, those cans sometimes, uh, especially the thinner things like clear coats. Uh, it recommends a lot of spray stuff, especially with the creature cast. If you're doing foam coating, coating uh, it sprays it sprays a little weird. Uh, it's a little different than regular paints. So there's um, number one something I forgot to mention with the creature cast is it sprays a lot better oddly enough if you purchase their thickener and thicken it up and then dilute it back down with water uh, it just has better surface adhesion um, that was just a, a quirky little thing that I first found out from modulus props uh, when he was playing around with it a few years ago uh, and it works it works really well but just light coats uh, a few light coats um, as as everything starts to build up on a pot on each other it'll start to fill in and uh just something to be patient also takes practice uh knowing the material uh that's one of pretty much the biggest thing is just play around experience it uh and uh just mess mess with the material do some tests before you do that final application uh don't spray too heavy um and uh, it'll be okay Second question on the paint really quick uh, from Power Up Props. Uh, the metallic finish, uh, which I'll talk about later. Um, Imperial Surface Aluma Luster. Uh, it is an industrial paint, uh, or excuse me, an industry paint. Um, it's what Marvel uses. It's what Lucasfilms uses. It's a, a wonderful, wonderful surface. Uh, it's expensive, unfortunately, because it is an industry paint. It's a weird um, resin and acrylic hybrid. It's proprietary, but the results speak for themselves. Pretty much any any metallic shine um, or chrome or kind of like darker metallic like this that you have seen in a, a Marvel or a Star Wars or recent Star Wars movie or show has been with this as a base. Uh, it's the best base metallic paint that I have used, honestly. 
Um, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later as well. But long story short, um, Imperial Surface, boop, Aluma Luster. That's the base on that. Uh, same base they use in the show. Uh, hey, Joe, uh, thank you for that. Uh, please shoot us a message um, because unfortunately that is not the topic of the panel. Um, as for Clara, can you paint it by hand? Uh, is that referencing the foam? Foam or 3D print? Uh, you can, honestly, you can paint You can paint everything by hand if you want to. Uh, uh, for, for bulk surface areas, I prefer uh, propellants, um, be it airbrush or rattle can or something like that, just to, it's easier to alleviate um, brush marks and brush strokes and things like that. Um, but uh, you can achieve uh, great finishes by hand brushing. Um, Steve, uh, uh, Stephen, Stephen K. Smith over at SKS Props, he actually has some great YouTube videos on uh, some high quality brushing techniques and things like that. Um, a lot of a lot of awesome stuff. Uh, a lot of his Borderland stuff he paints by hand, so it's definitely definitely an option. Uh, we can clear coat. Um, I will come back to to clear coating stuff and all that finishing once we get past um, base material prep. No worries, Joe. Uh, thank you for mentioning mentioning it. And I apologize uh, for that. Okay, so finishing preps resin. Let's talk about resin really quick. Um, resin prep, similar to 3D printing, it's a little different, uh, a little different because you do a lot of that finishing prep before you do your molds. Um, this particular, uh, cast was cold cast. So cold casting is a little different because you typically won't paint over it. Um, you can you can paint for it. It's, it is a good thing to do to achieve uh, good durability as well. But uh, this is uh, done in a full aluminum cold cast. Um, it's a lot of surface prep for this involves a lot of fine sanding and burnishing uh, to get the nice metallic shine. Excuse me. Uh, once you get the plastic um, from the casting process off. With uh, non-cold casted pieces, uh, once once you pull the cast, a lot of the surface prep is similar to 3D printing. Uh, not as much sanding because it's a cleaner surface to begin with. So uh, you'll you'll kind of if you do want to get a high gloss, you'll typically maybe do a last few passes of that wet sanding, and then uh, uh, you'll go through and do your primer coat and any any polishing or thing after that. Uh, any questions on resin stuff? Moving along. Uh, leather, leather, leather's a different, different ball game. I just wanted to put in here really quick. Uh, if you guys are familiar with leather working, uh, it's very, very different. Surface prep pretty much involves moisturization, uh, which is not something that we would do with anything else. Uh, Pretty much you want to make sure that your leather is moist with a neat foot oil or a mink oil. Um, even if you've got a, uh, a just a straight up regular olive oil, that'll work as well. And um, what that moisture does is it opens up the pores of the leather to allow the dye to seep in better. Uh, if you're painting on top of it, it's still good to moisturize it just to get the moisture in there to, uh, to help with that when you're moving along. Hello, Rob. And uh, last but not least, uh, kind of kit bash. Again, similar processes. Almost like, like any anything rigid structure is a base from. Um, a lot of the preparation process is pretty much identical. So uh, you'll you'll do a lot of your base sanding and then your primer coats, primer filler coats, and then your base coat and go on from there. Um, one of the beauties of, of doing a more rigid structure is you don't need to worry about the things that come with flexibility. Uh, just, just the flexible nature of 
uh, resins, or excuse me, not resins, foams, um, and even some some softer like urethane rubbers and things like that, you need to take in consideration because anything you put on top of that needs to also be flexible, so it flexes with your base material. Uh, any any questions on that stuff so far? Um, I don't even know if we've got anything coming up on Instagram. If you are viewing us on Instagram, I hope things are going okay, but I can't see anything that's coming in with chat. Uh, but thank you for being here. So, everything has been surface prepped. And now we get to the fun part. So... As I mentioned, specifically with high gloss surfaces, uh, a lot of a lot of these techniques can be applied to the rigid base and the and the soft base as long as that that surface preparation is done first. Um, with a lot of rigid rigid stuff, uh, pretty much the the high gloss finishes not only rely on a clean base surface to work with, but also the uh, the gloss of your base coat. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, especially a lot of this stuff, these and like all clad paints and things like that, a lot of high metallic, uh, it's, they're mildly translucent. So any, uh, any gloss or satin or matte finishes that are on that base layer as you spray everything down are going to pop through on that top layer as you try to achieve it. So essentially you, you pretty much want to have a nice high polish on your base coat before you start even spraying these kind of metallics. Uh, it's again, all comes down to surface prep, surface prep and patience. And when you start laying this kind of stuff down, if you are in a paint booth, make sure that the area is clean because any of those little dust particles or fuzzes are gonna pop right up on there. Uh, it's, it's really the only secret is uh, surface preparation and uh, making sure you've got a clean painting environment. It's uh, it not only goes through for the aluminum luster, but any all clad crumbs, uh, spastics, things like that. Hi Bjorn. Talking about painting and distressing and aging techniques. Trying some multi stream on Facebook, Instagram, and the Twitch. So, actual distressing. Let's talk about the funness. Uh, I have an interesting process when I kind of go through distressing techniques. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's, uh, it's a means to tell a story. It's, you develop a history, you develop a life for this prop that, uh, proper costume that you're trying to display and put out into the world. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of factors that I like to take into consideration when uh, when we start adding dirts and grimes and damages and things like that. Uh, number one, um, atmosphere. Different atmospheres uh, typically result in different types of dirt and grime buildup. Uh, a lot of subtle things uh, like uh, hue variations. Um, A different, uh, different color browns, different color grays, uh, different kind of textures and things like that. Uh, one thing that I will say right now is uh, black is not a naturally occurring, uh, naturally occurring color. Excuse me. Um, even things that kind of appear black, like oils and charcoals and things like that, they're really, really, really dark grays. Uh, that's uh, a common technique to do a lot of a lot of black shading for your low lights in armors and things like that. Uh, it, it looks great, but if you want to give a little extra life and uh, history to that, you can achieve a lot of subtle details, especially if you're working with hero props, up close shots, uh, something that you'd like to achieve more in like a, comp a competition scene if you're in, going to cosplay. But um, a lot of dark browns, charcoals varying shades of gray, uh, they all layer up and stack up to kind of give that big old smush uh, and amalgamation of color, which 
uh, changes depending upon the environment that you're working with. A lot of Star Wars stuff that uh, I really like to do uh, is uh, more warmer tones. Uh, it's a gritty environment. It's more kind of that Old West style with uh, warm tones, dirts. You're sometimes, depending upon where you're located in the Star Wars universe, say you're on Corellia or Coruscant, uh, depending upon the level of Coruscant, a lot of gritty grimes and oils, things like that, possibly some soot. Uh, again, that's all, it's all darker browns and uh, grays and stuff that build upon each other, a lot of different textures and, and things as well. Um, if you're more into kind of the futuristic kind of sci-fi side of the world, uh, they typically lean more towards uh, cooler tones, things like that. Uh, it's a, a more advanced, a cleaner environment. You still kind of have your dirt and grimes depending upon where you're at. Uh, carbon scoring can go on both sides of those environments, but uh, the cooler tones kind of give more of that chill, advanced look. Um, and uh, we'll talk about what you can do to kind of manipulate some of the same same techniques, make your own washes and things like that when you start to try to, to do things. And then we'll also go into uh, actual rusting techniques, uh, like textures and all that fun stuff. So uh, environment or situations, in addition to where we're at, um, is there wind blowing? Is it sand filled? Is it something like Tatooine when it's all sand? Is it a foresty environment? Are we in a cold, dark spaceship? Are we in some kind of futuristic planet? Are we a highly technologically advanced society, kind of like the Protoss or something? Um, all those all those factors come into play. It's also, when we're talking about battle damage, scratches, weapon hits, things like that, what are we fighting against? Is it... Uh, a projectile based technology is it hard hand to hand combat with like swords and spears and knives and things like that uh, if we're going more to like a fantasy based technique uh, plasma bolts energy effects uh, all that kind of weird stuff it's all, all those little details you can kind of play into how the um, how the damage is going to look on the armor um, how the how the colors and variations, be it like carbon scoring and things like that, are going to play into effect. With uh, let's go with projectile stuff. Uh, first, uh, so as I kind of mentioned and went over earlier, there's all these all these small gashes and uh, bullets and things like that. DC universe typically takes place in our time. We don't really have any energy weapons, so we're looking at uh, different kind of bullets, different kind of polymers and materials, um, lightweight alloy metals and things like that. Not only should you, or if you want to, uh, you don't have to do anything. Um, you take into consideration what's hitting you, but what is it hitting? Like what's, what's, what's the armor made out of, or what are you trying to synthesize? Uh, metal, composite, polymers, all that fun stuff. A lot, a lot of little micro thoughts, depending upon how that impact is going to affect and look on the armor. Um, with the Robin armor, we kind of went with like a um, your kind of typical tactical armor look. So it's got the the nice metal holes uh, for for the bullets. Um, so have your scratches, lighter scratches, gouges. Uh, maybe somebody was swinging an axe at them. Um, things like that. Uh, as we'll go over that kind of um, damage and things like that, uh, we'll put that in with the Dremel, as I mentioned earlier, do our sealant, do our base coats, preps like that. Uh, and then uh, well, what we'll do what we is referred to as kind of a highlighting. Highlight, similar to makeup techniques, is you're trying to pull light into that attention to give it a brighter appearance. With a lot of painting and prop stuff, it's uh, typically a metallic effect. Uh, also, we can do highlight on base materials to give variations in dirt and things like that. We can, highlighting and low lighting, we'll talk about and how they kind of complement each other and kind of how you can 
rub things on and off depending upon the material that you're working with. Um, uh, surface prep, um, we, we haven't touched on XPS at all. We've just been doing EVAs, leathers, and resins and stuff. Um, but with XPS, typically a, a resin or some kind of rigid top coat works really well. Uh, Mark's question was just uh, looking over uh, surface prep on XPS, like the pink insulation one. Uh, so specifically metallic highlights, uh, a very, very common technique is dry brushing. So with dry brushing, if you can kind of see, uh, there's those little metal highlights and stuff on all the edges. Uh, what that does is simulate wear, uh, wear and tear, be it, be it a scratch in paint, be it a um, just a rubbing of a top coat, things like that. With dry brushing, there's a few different routes you can go. There's a few different routes you can go. Uh, what I like to do is um, liquid leaf. Uh, this is, or, excuse me. Uh, that's not pulling up well uh, due to the light, but this is a liquid leaf paint. It's a uh, are you an oil? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an oil-based paint. Um, it is a little flammable. It's got a nice smell to it. Uh, it's got a really good pigment transfer, which I like, and it's uh, relatively durable. You can find these at most hobby shops. Um, and then uh, Liquitex Heavy Body makes a uh, iridescent rich silver, uh, which is really, really good. Uh, this Robin armor specifically was all done with uh, Createx paints and then the Liquitex rich silver. Uh, you want to make sure that you get the, um, the brush with paint on it when you're doing the dry brushing. Dry brushing is a brush technique. Uh, but if there's too much paint on it, you'll get uh, a lot of streaks and things. You just want enough paint to allow a pigment transfer between the brush and the object so you can get that kind of casual rubbing look. Uh, any, anything, anything too wet you'll notice really quick because it gets really streaky uh, and uh, starts to get that synthetic look to it. So it's something that you want to uh, just be mindful of. Uh, you almost want to wipe the brush off, um, especially on the liquid leaf, until it looks like uh, there's nothing on it and then you can start just kind of slowly rubbing the, the, the edges and things like that to kind of give those nice little pigment views. Um, you can kind of see it on the base of this charge. Uh, just very, very, very light and subtle details. Um, and then it's just, just a very light and mild pigment transfer. Uh, without without getting a lot of that streaking effects. Uh, it's it's a slower process, but it gives a more realistic effect for uh, abrasions and wear and tear and things like that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be silver with dry brushing. Uh, you can do you can do it with a lot of metallics. Uh, any anything that you need to to show that there's a base coat underneath your top coat, uh, dry brushing works really, really well. Uh, Angus, Angus, do you smudge or rub paint on for wear marks? Uh, so there's a uh, difference between, uh, excuse me, lost my train of thought. Um, I'll typically do like again a small brush or a larger brush depending upon the surface area that I'm cover, and it's uh, just very very light pigment transfer. Uh, it's again a slower process, and you want to make sure you're getting the color transfer from the brush to your object without uh, getting a lot of the streaky stuff. Uh, with products like Rub and Buff, you can typically use your finger. A lot of the same thing and just kind of lightly rub it on. Um, that's a wax-based product, also really good. Um, and I have used it in the past. It's just something that I've gotten away from. 
Uh, question from Diana. Contrast between highlights and shadows. Uh, picking places for each. Uh, I will talk about low lights in a moment. Actually, next. So uh, highlights, uh, typically dry brushing, things like that, uh, removing some of the dark things. Uh, with a lot of the low light work, we do what is called a wash. A wash is uh, used, I use a lot of acrylics and uh, oil paints. Uh, a wash is a great way to get a kind of a mucky, dirty look. Um, if you can see like the brown and grime in here, um, that's all done with oil washes. And uh, it's a great way to simulate uh, grime buildup, dirt, and things like that. Uh, Killian, I will talk about chips in a moment. Uh, it's uh, next on our list. Uh, with washes, um, you want to make sure that the there's a good sealant uh, because sometimes, especially when you're working with oils, it can reactivate the paint underneath it. Uh, this is a, uh, a floor wax uh, on top of it to protect the paint underneath it, just to provide that barrier. There, uh, for uh, you can do acrylic washes. Uh, when I do my acrylic washes, you um, I still use the Liquitex Heavy Body. Acrylic washes are great because they dry a lot faster than oil paints. Uh, you can still get similar looks if you uh, mix in like a, a satin or a gloss medium to kind of get that mucky effect with it as well. Uh, if you're working on a very short time crunch, uh, it's a much better option than oils. Uh, oils are at least for kind of warmer and uh, kind of grimy dirt environments, especially with like post-apocalyptic and things like that. Uh, it's something that I prefer because I like the way they blend better. You can get a lot of different, like very micro hue variations and uh, a lot of uh, smearing effects as well. Uh, I like Winton, Winton colors and uh, uh, Winston and Newton are also very good, uh, good paints. The Blick, the Blick uh, brand is great as well. Uh, my three favorite browns, uh, these are the three browns that I use on everything. So my darkest is uh, raw umber. That's what I get for a lot of my dark, deep, deep browns for a lot of deep crevices and things like that. And I'll talk about placement in a moment. Uh, this is a burnt umber, a little bit lighter than the raw umber, uh, just a little bit of variation. So you get some of those tonal differences like sands and things like that. Uh, and burnt sienna. Burnt sienna is a much more red orange brown. And uh, it's really great for emulating rust effects. If you're hanging out on Arrakis and get in some spice, that's typically a much more red sand, uh, things like that. And uh, they all work really well in conjunction with each other. Uh, I will typically use all three to get very different color variations. Um, again, it's very, very subtle stuff, but uh, life by nature is is very multi-tonal. So I like to try to bring that across when I'm doing that. When I'm when we're talking about placements uh, for things like that, is I want to think about where where this dirt's going to sit. Uh, for the most part, especially if you're out in the field, things like that, there's going to be all these tight little crevices and divots and things like that, that even if you are doing a field cleaning, um, unless you get some fine precision cleaning tools, that stuff's just going to hang out in those divots and build up and create these different colors and things like that. Um, and uh, you just kind of build up on those. Uh, kind of a similar process when you're building up rust. Any place where all the dirt and grime is going to sit is also a deeper place in corners where rust and water can build up to uh, promote that oxidation. Uh, so that's what um, what I usually do for kind of placements. Uh, if if you're not sure where to do it, just slap slap a big old wide wash on everything and then wipe it all away. 
Uh, it's going to do the same process as if you're doing that field cleaning and any kind of dip or divot or uh, little tight corner or things like that, that dirt's going to remain anyway. So you've got, got that same exact process that you're trying to emulate. And then if you want to add some splotches and just like some, some little, little things here and there, uh, you can just add it back in. Just let it sit. Um, sometimes I'll just kind of dab it away with a rag or something like that. And you can go from there. Um, there's also a process called pin washing. Uh, those in the, the model painting scene uh, and any modeling scene, it's the same, uh, same exact process, except you're applying that wash with a much finer precision, usually a precision brush or thing, like just little micro areas if you've got any uh, engravings or things like that. That engraving is also going to pick up those little dirts, but you don't want to cover the paint with uh, that complete... Or, 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 or. Uh, you don't want to cover the paint with that com like a complete surface wash. So you can take a little fine brush and do these pin washes and get into those tiny crevices, dab them away, so you still get a little bit of that tonal differentiation, but you're not completely covering the whole thing. Uh, Another wash, um, I've had a lot of Mando stuff with me today, just little little dirts and things like that. If it'll focus, you can kind of see it, fine edges, um, even on top of the abrasions and things like that. Uh, even in some of these colors, like corners and things like that. Um, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of different stuff that you can do. With, uh, with that, um, let's talk about paint chipping. Because Killian asked about paint chipping. Uh, let me pull this guy up. Uh, this is the Mando thigh plate with paint chipping. Uh, this was done, unfortunately, quickly, so I would like to do a lot more layers, but you can still see that nice chip effect with it. Uh, in order to achieve chipping, it's a typically a multi-layer process. So you'll do your base coat. Uh, in this instance, it is our Luma Luster. And uh, then the second coat is this nice kind of warm brown. What you want to do is apply a, uh, a fluid uh, masking agent. A lot of different things you can use. Uh, they make masking latex, Vaseline. Uh, ketchup, uh, mustard works really well. I know some people have used toothpaste, uh, but any any place that you want this initial chipping to be exposed, you'll place your masking agent there, and then you'll spray your next layer of paint. Typically, you want to do two to three layers. Like ideally, uh, I would have before I did this brown coat, I would have done a primer coat, um, sprayed it over there. Then when that primer coat dried, I would have applied a, let's just focus on this dot right here. I would have applied a uh, another layer of masking agent, just a little bit more around the edge. Uh, so that masking agent layer covers some of that second coat that I put on. Uh, make sure it's asymmetrical because uh, chipping doesn't occur, occur symmetrically. Um, then I'll put that second layer of masking agent on and then I would do this top coat. Once everything uh, sets up, uh, then you wipe all of that off, and then you've got a nice multi-layer chipping effect. And you can do that for as many layers as you want to achieve a very, very used and repainted look if you really want to. Hopefully that answered your question, Killian. Uh, with uh, chipping, we'd also go abrasion. Abrasion kind of goes with uh, uh, the leather work and pretty much everything as well. Um, with abrasion, if you can kind of see these high points that looked like uh, paint got rubbed off, it's because paint rubbed off. The only thing that we are doing with this is accelerating and synthesizing the uh, the friction that something could occur in real life. Uh, so a very, like a higher grit sandpaper is what I'll typically use, be it on this, this, uh, this kind of stuff, or uh, especially leather work as well. Um, I am well, Bjorn. Sorry, I clicked on that by accident. Uh, uh, 
you can kind of see kind of the lighter points on the on the leather work. Uh, same kind of thing. It's just just higher grit sandpaper to accelerate friction. Um, that's all we're trying to do when we synthesize that kind of wear and tear. Uh, let's. Uh, I'm going to talk about two more things. Uh, any questions on this stuff so far? Uh, I want to talk about carbon scoring and hot metal effects really quick. So in addition to the dirts, uh, the dirts and the grime and all that stuff, whoop, um, especially in the sci-fi land, you want to emulate uh, blaster hits, uh, energy weapon hits, and things like that. Um, this is done with airbrush, uh, all-clad hot carbon line. If you guys aren't familiar with um, the all-clad paints, um, this is... That light is just showing everything wrong. Uh, the the hot metal line is wonderful. It's a beautifully beautiful paint line. Uh, they are uh, translucent paints to emulate uh, different heating effects, colors, and things like that. Um, you can kind of see um, the red, blue, and violet on here. If I can tilt this fork, actually, this comes off. Um, it also comes off. Uh, the the hot metal effect on the fork of the, the pulse phase rifle, all done with the hot metal colors. Uh, it just you're trying to emulate that color of metal getting hot, be it from from use or getting shot, things like that. And these paints layer up really well because they're translucent, so you can get this nice deep deep dark color effect um, with the warmer hues. This is again done with the hot carbon. And then uh, I did the violet on the outside to kind of give that little color shift. I mean, you can kind of see here that the hot carbon has got more of that brown hue to it as well. Or you can apply it on lighter um, to get this used blaster barrel look um, in all these kind of dark brownie shades, things like that. Uh, not only do they have the burnt carbon, they've got a regular carbon, they've got a smoky black, they've got different hot metal colors from uh, brown, blue, violet, sepia, uh, lots of stuff, really, really cool paints. Uh, some of my favorite stuff that I've recently started using to emulate those kind of scoring effects and all that jazz. Uh, and... Rust. Rusting effects are super, super, super cool, especially when we start talking about uh, post-apocalyptic fallout next week. Um, there's a lot of things that, that you can emulate with the rust that don't transfer through to when you actually try to do the real thing. Uh, specifically, a lot of subtle reds, oranges, and even some whites, depending upon the reagent for the oxidation, uh, and texture on top of that, which is really, really cool. As you can kind of see on uh, on the back of this Fallout helmet, it's uh, the oxidation produces a really kind of cool rough texture, which if you've looked at older cars, all that rough texture starts to pool through when uh, when it does start to oxidize. Uh, it's really, really, really easy to achieve. You can even do it kind of in that similar chip and masking layer effect if you want to do that kind of layering to look like the rust is popping through that chip layer. Uh, you pretty much lay down your uh, white glue, like Elmer's or something like that, and then you'll dust on top of that a very fine powder uh, or a fine ground iron powder. Uh, you can get it on eBay or Amazon, things like that. Once the white glue dries, it encapsulates the rust powder inside of it, and then I use a reagent to activate the oxidation. Uh, typically, I'll do a blend of hydrogen peroxide, white vinegar, and table salt. Uh, and if I want to expedite the process, I'll apply heat. Uh, heat gives you a really bright, rich, uh, orange, orange looking rust. And uh, if you let it sit, for a longer time to let it naturally occur, you can get some really, really cool dripping effects uh, that you would get if something was sitting out in the wild and you didn't wipe it down or take care of it. Uh, and then once you get all that rust in place, you can spray it down with a matte sealer 
or something like that. Um, and also go back and apply your oil or acrylic washes to kind of blend everything in and get that little extra bit of depth. Uh, any other uh, questions on anything? Uh, we're coming up on our hour for our runtime, so I appreciate all you guys being here. Uh, let's take, I can take a few questions if you guys have anything. Um, Mark, to kind of go back to uh, what you asked about clear coats earlier. Uh, yes, uh, you can do clear coats. Uh, depends on what you're doing. Uh, metallics are tough to do. Uh, the best clear coats to use over metallics, while they're harder to apply because you need uh, more specialized uh, Equipment, um, the 2K automotive to, uh, clear coats. This was done with a, a quick shine heavy duty floor wax, uh, old school technique, but it still works really well. Not as durable as that urethane clear coat, but it provides a nice protective bar barrier uh, for the oil paints and also a nice luster. Uh, so that is uh, something that I uh, we found actually for our hardwood floors. Uh, the biggest key when you're looking at floor waxes is the Carnuba wax that's built into that. Um, that provides a nice polishable shine um, and super lasting luster. Uh, so yeah, all, all, all of my version one Mandalorian armor was uh, coated in the floor wax. All floor wax on top of the Illuma luster paint. Um, it, it works really, really well in a pinch. If you've got the time, definitely definitely do the 2K clear coat. Uh, so really quick, I'll go over the quick paints that I used. Um, for the top coat, for all the Mandalorian stuff, it's Imperial Surface Aluma Luster. Uh, for the base coats on this specific, uh, specific version, uh, the Rust-Oleum Filler Primer was wet sanded to a 2000 grit, uh, then a uh, all clad gloss black on version two. I will be doing a filler primer with the 2K uh, clear coat on top of it and then polishing the clear coat to get the polish layer for the base coat and then spraying this. Uh, Spaz Sticks Chrome is also a good, nice chrome metallic. Uh, it's cheaper than the all clad, but I think it's got a very similar finish and also a similar application with the airbrush. Uh, also, I uh, really like their pale gold, which I'll be using on our armor or helmet. Um, for highlighting, liquid leaf paints, uh, Liquitex heavy bodies. Uh, and then typically for distressing, I'll use my oils. Uh, with the oils, uh, what you want to do is also dilute it with a naphtha uh, and allow it to flash. It allows the paint to flow into these tighter crevices a lot easier. And uh, it's a uh, little volatile, but it makes for a great result. Uh, and then also don't remember the hot carbon line. Hot carbon line is wonderful. Uh, we also use a lot of uh, Createx auto air paints and their wicked and regular colors. A lot of custom mixes with their uh, 4030 urethane additive for durability and things like that. Uh, and uh, for the foam, base coat was the Creature Cast Semi Rigid. Uh, thank you guys for being here. You all are fantastic. It's really awesome. Again, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to contact us. That's all of our social media information. Uh, it's HDC Fabrication everywhere. Uh, also, also, our website and our email address uh, if you prefer to communicate that way. Um, if there's any questions after the fact, uh, Clara, uh, if you have any questions regarding molding, please feel free to shoot a message. Uh, may do a stream uh, later this month on molding and casting techniques. It is one of our regular uh, our panel questions. Um, again, thank you guys. My name is Tim Harrison with HDC Fabrication. We're based in Chicago, Illinois. Thank you to uh, Arta Wigs for hosting Articon and getting all this stuff together. Uh, if you have any questions on foam, traditional sculpting, 3D sculpting, printing, practical effects, uh, techniques, uh, regular finishing techniques, please feel free to hit us up. And, and uh, 
I very appreciate you guys being here. Uh, thank you all, and I believe the drag show for Articon is this evening as well. I hope to put this panel um, on YouTube once we get the, uh, the, uh, the video downloaded. So keep an eye out, follow us on social media. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here, and you have a fantastic evening.